I know you talk here about respite, and, and um, we as a party are bringing a motion this evening uh, highlighting the fact that respite is, um, is actually declining. Um, the provision is, is, has gone down. The, the provision of respite in 2022 is less than it was in 2018, and it's obviously um, in, in decline since 2008 as well. And we know how many families received respite in 2022 and in 2018. But do we have any idea how many are looking for respite? I mean, is there any way of gauging that? Because I know I've heard from so many families and they're, they're on a waiting list. And there's, you know, um, for example, in my own area, there's one facility between Cavan and Monaghan and it's children one week and adults the next. There's a second place in Monaghan that does provide some for adults as well. And I have to admit they provide a very good service. Um, and in fact, where it's provided is, is generally very, very good. Um, so it's just, you know, we're calling for our, in our motion um, to address the deficits identified in disability capacity few. We still don't have an implementation plan for that. Respite is, is included in that, as well as many other disability services. Um, but you're talking about housing. There's no implementation plan yet for the national strategy for housing for disabled people, which hopefully, again, we've been promised it will be imminent within weeks. That's what I was told what, about two weeks ago, and still no sign of it. Um, and I suppose you talk about all family support there for um, people with autism. And like, we have a brilliant resource in the Middletown Centre for Autism, which does that um, in the north, but unfortunately still a pilot programme in the south, even though it's in place since 2007. Now, Minister Norma Foley promised that it would be expanded this year, so I'm hoping that will be the case. But I know they only provide support to, I think, 12 children identified by the, by the NCSE compared to 60 in the north. And you consider our populations, we obviously have a much higher population here. So, I mean, is it something like that you're talking about where, you know, um, is, uh, the child is given supports not in school, but also in the home, and that the family are given supports as well? Because um, I think that would be really important. Well, okay. Um, well, I think your question on the respite, there is, we, we had spoken about, there's no, we need an audit, a national audit of what respite beds there are, what provisions there are, and then looking at the gaps. We don't have that. We've been calling for it for 20 years um, with the HSE. So until we get that, we can't plan and we don't know, you know what, what the future needs are either. We're also calling for a register so family carers can sign up to the register and say, yes, I need respite, I need X amount. Um, and the age, the condition of the child, the person they're caring for, again, so they, you can have that future planning. So I think, and I, I read your motion and we would welcome uh, your, your motion around the, the respite in particular. Um, on, I suppose just to go back to the housing again, because another issue that keeps coming up is housing adaptation grants mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, the maximum you can get is €30,000, whereas most families, when they price up getting a full adaptation, a downstairs bathroom, you're talking about €60,000. Yeah. Families can't afford to, you know, put the rest of that up. Mm -hmm. So while they might be on waiting lists, they can't afford to go ahead with it. So that's another issue. Um, in terms of the uh, support in the school, um, I suppose that is about, you know, individual child's needs as well. And, you know, a lot of families are choosing, they want their child to go to mainstream school, for example. And that means they give up, you know, potentially a place in a, a special school. But by doing that, they also lose out on the supports that they should get in mainstream school. Mm. And their child, and Claire talked about inclusivity. We, the, the family care that was meant to be here today actually was going to speak about how she choose mainstream school for her child, but she has not seen inclusivity. You know, things like even excluding children from the school play because they don't have what the school might see as the skill set, you know, to be involved. So, so that inclusivity is that cult need for cultural change mm -hmm. so that all children are welcome, they're in they are in really included, um, and that's really important. Claire, do you want to add to yeah, that? Can I just start by acknowledging Pauline, our Deputy Tully, and all the work that she does. She's a co-chair of the Oireachtas Cross-Party Interest Group on Family Carers, so she has been brilliant, and I just want to acknowledge all the work that Pauline has done. Um, yeah, I, I don't have much more to add to that. Just to, to go back to the housing thing, um, you know, one of the other issues with housing, um, my colleague Andrew Rooney has done brilliant work on doing research across the local authorities and actually looking at how each of the local authorities treat and assess caring households for the purposes of the differential rent scheme. 
So he has a table that actually shows between the lowest local authority and the highest. There's a difference of, off the top of my head, I think it's about 80%. No, maybe that's not. It is, I think, 80%. There's a huge difference okay. in, in the rent rates based on the autonomy of each local authority to say, I will include the half rate carers allowance, I will exclude it. I will I assess carers allowance at the basic rate. I'll, so they, they all have autonomy to, to assess it as they wish, but we have that piece of work that's really, really interesting that shows the differences. And actually the department are due to do a review of the differential rent scheme. It's one of the commitments in the programme for government that they will standardise the differential rents across the country. But actually I understand from the department that that's not going to be open for public consultation. So we'll submit that without being invited to do it. Um, and yeah, just going back to the register and how we figure out respite, where do we go with this? And actually one of the things I mentioned earlier that thankfully the Department of Social Protection are going to um, have a, a new, I have to be careful of my language on this, but there's, there will be a new way that long-term carers will be assessed for state pension contributory pur purposes for the, from the 1st of June in 2024. And actually, one of the biggest challenges that they now, but the Pensions Commission before them had, is how do we identify who these carers are? How do I know that Claire Duffy cared for 20 years and Catherine only cared for 16? How do I know? Because the spirit of this new rule is that you shouldn't have had to have been getting carers allowance or whatever before, so they have to figure it out. So they've created a register where carers can register themselves as being in that category. So it's it's almost a self-declaration. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so a lot of trust goes into that, but something similar for respite. Mm -hmm. That actually, you know, is it up to the state to figure out where every person that needs respite is in every pocket of the country? Maybe it's up to us to come forward and say, well, I live in Connemara and I have a child with autism and I need to do it. I know GDPR and things could be problematic and stuff, but I think that's maybe a start that we need to, to look at. Mm -hmm.